Welcome to CarSale's best electric car for 2023. Sales of EVs are currently booming and we've assembled six of the best and newest on the market for the ultimate shootout. We're going to delve into everything from charging times to driving performance, practicality and technology. But before we get into that, hit the like button, subscribe and let us know your comments on the winner. EVs now account for about 8% of the new car market, well up on the same time in 2022. In some market segments, such as midsize SUVs, electric cars are selling in serious volumes. The market is dominated by Tesla, but the heat is being applied to the EV specialist. New circa $40,000 hatchbacks have landed, the Polestar 2 has been heavily updated, and the Cupra Born is trying to lure people out of their hot hatchbacks. We've got them all here and we're going to put them under the car sales testing knife using the following criteria. Safety, technology, comfort and convenience, driving performance and ownership costs. We'll also be delving into the things people really want to know about their EVs, such as how fast can it be charged and how far it'll go before needing a top up. The Tesla Model Y came second last year, but it remains Australia's top selling electric SUV. So it's back for another crack in 2023. The other five are either new or updated this year. So let's take a look at the six best EV contenders for 2023. First up is the Cupra Born, which shares plenty of beneath the skin with the upcoming Volkswagen ID3. It looks fun and funky and promises some hot hatch spice. Hyundai has heavily updated its Ionic 5 since its first arrival in 2021 and when it was named Cassell's Car of the Year. We've opted for the entry-level dynamic that brings more driving range and equipment. Next up is the GWM Aura, one of the most affordable EVs on the market. There's some mini-like design features, but it's the price that is the big appeal. It goes head-to-head -head with the MG4, a funky five-door that also has its price as the headline act. But the MG is also aiming for driving excitement, courtesy of a rear drive layout. Then it's the still fresh Polestar 2, the EV spin-off of Volvo. The Polestar 2 now goes further between charges and has undergone a major transformation since arriving in 2021. Instead of front drive, this entry level car is now rear wheel drive, a shift that highlights the packaging flexibility of EVs. And finally, our field is rounded out by the Tesla Model Y, the country's top selling EV so far this year, and one of the nation's most popular SUVs, period. This gives us six of the best and newest EVs on the market, but notable absentees are the Tesla Model 3, our reigning best EV, because a significant facelift is just around the corner. The other notable omission here is the Kia EV6, our reigning 2022 car of the year, which unlike the Ionic 5, hasn't been updated since last year, and there's a flagship GT to come. We've tried to go for the most affordable variants of each car because in most cases, they're the ones proving popular with buyers. For the GWM Aura and Polestar 2 though, we got a larger battery pack, something that adds thousands to the price. Still, the rest of each of these cars is the same as its more affordable alternative. So let's get into it. We'll cover off each car starting with the front seat, the rear, the boot, and finally we'll take all of them for a drive. Going roughly from smallest to largest means kicking off with the MG4. Not that it's small. Its dedicated EV platform and almost flat floor means there's loads of space up front. The seats are excellent and there's reasonable storage in the center console and doors. But this entry level Excite does miss out on some equipment. What is the wireless phone charger in higher variants is a slightly useless shelf and don't expect much from the stereo. There are no rear speakers and the front ones aren't particularly punchy. It's got a small 7 inch instrumentation cluster and a larger 10.25 inch infotainment screen. I would like to see some more shortcut buttons for things like ventilation. It just means you're not diving in through menus for some pretty basic tasks. The GWM Aura is deceptively spacious inside. Up front, there is loads of headroom and a very clean layout. 
and we see some of those exterior design themes come through to the cabin, like these toggle switches, for example. It's loaded with gear for the money. Wireless phone charger, powered front seats, 360 degree camera, fake leather and a 10.25 inch instrumentation cluster and matching central infotainment screen. The finishes and materials all look and feel pretty classy, even the faux leather quilted fabric. There are a couple of cubby holes, but there's not much in the way of covered storage. The Cupra Born is more about style and sass than it is budget EV motoring. Inside, the Bourne uses a lot of recycled plastic, so it continues that green theme, but then there are really modern materials that tell a story of the fact that there's more to the Cupra Born than just zero emissions transport. There's a tiny 5.3 inch digital cluster, while the infotainment screen stretches to 12 inches. It's crisp and clear, but some of the functionality isn't great. The volume control is a slider, for example, and you've got to dig into menus to adjust the ventilation. There's no issue, however, finding spots for odds and sods in here. The Cooper Born has plenty of nice covered options in the centre console here. It's got deep indoor pockets, and as with everything else in this car, it's really nicely presented. Next up, it's the Polestar. And this is the only car on test that is based on a petrol powered platform. And that leads to some compromises like this quite tall center console. Along with a fairly low roof line, it is borderline compact in here. No issues with the presentation though. The Polestar is a genuine luxury car with terrific attention to detail. From the ambient lighting to the seat trim and every piece of plastic throughout the cabin. There's a 12.3 inch instrument cluster and beautifully clear 11.1 inch infotainment screen. Polestar has handed the back end to Google, so it's the Android automotive operating system. That means embedded Google apps, including navigation and the ability to download independent apps. It works well and it teams plenty of functionality with ease of use. We like that there are some shortcut buttons as well as this large dial for your audio volume. It may look a little bit like an oversized hatchback, but the Ionic 5 is a large SUV inside. It's a really wide cabin and it gives a great sense of space up the front. The two 12.3 inch screens headline a long list of equipment. Head up display, ambient lighting, surround view camera, wireless phone charging. It's all standard in this dynamic model. Finishes and materials are modern, though they're quite different to what you see in other Hyundais to match the retro exterior and improve sustainability. There's also no shortage of hidey holes, including a large binnacle in the center. And this whole center console slides back and forward so you can put it exactly where you want it. Finally, we have the Tesla Model Y. The cabin is a blend of tech and minimalist design, and it certainly won't be to everybody's taste. There is a lot to like, but it's probably not what most people would expect when stepping into a luxury car. For example, this fake leather is quite obviously very fake. There's also no instrument cluster, so you have to divert your gaze to the 15 inch central screen to see the speedo. That screen also controls much of the car, from operating the boot, the bonnet, and even the glove box. But delve around the menus and there's plenty packed in. Arcade games, a dash cam recorder, the ability to monitor the car remotely, and even a light show. Yes, it's occasionally gimmicky, but it's indicative of the thinking with Tesla. As for which is best on infotainment, it's a fight between the Hyundai and the Tesla. The Model Y has more charging options, superior tech and trinkets, and a much better sound system. But the Ionic 5 fights back with a more user-friendly layout and nicer materials and attention to detail. All six cars have a high level of safety and all get the maximum five-star safety rating. But as always, that safety rating doesn't tell the whole story. The MG4 Excite, for example, misses out on blind spot warning and rear cross traffic alert. They are two things we've come to expect in most new cars. 
at least there's auto braking and various assistance systems, things that also come standard on the others. In the rear of the MG4, it's taller adults who may struggle a little bit with the headroom. Smaller adults like me and children will be totally fine. It also helps that the floor is almost flat, so legroom is pretty respectable. Perhaps more of an issue may be the lack of air vents back here, but you do have one USB point to charge up your devices. The rear seat of the Aura is something of a surprise. By compact hatchback standards, it's surprisingly spacious, particularly the headroom. There's also good knee room and a USB charger, but like the MG, there are also no rear air vents. Next up is the Cooper Bond, but there's one large catch with this. If you opt for either the performance or the interior pack, neither of which we have on this car, then you lose this rear middle seat, which reduces your occupant capacity to just four. It also doesn't have rear ventilation, but at least what the second row does get is that attention to detail, which is a highlight throughout the cabin. It also dishes up some pretty good knee room, which partially compensates for this lower roof line. Climbing into the back seat of the Polestar instantly reveals the downside of an ICE vehicle platform. This really big hump in the middle makes it pretty tight and awkward for the middle occupant. Also, given this car's external dimensions, it's a little tight and it's pretty average head and leg room. However, the overall quality ambience here, it's high quality. It feels good and a big glass roof really adds to that sense of spaciousness. The Ionic 5's broad cabin means fitting three occupants in the second row is pretty easily done. They will be sitting a tad high though, because their battery sits beneath the cabin, everything's perched up slightly, but as far as outright occupant comfort goes, it's excellent. You also get directional air vents, charge points too, so there's little chance of complaints from this second row. Lastly, we're in the Tesla Model Y, which has huge amount of headspace here and ordinarily that would be a huge tick from us but in the case of the model y it comes at a cost visibility these seats are positioned quite low which means you've got heaps of headroom but you see a lot of the back of the front seats and it also hinders your forward vision you can't see a lot of the road from here which some passengers might not find ideal there are no other qualms in the back of here though. You've got plenty of leg room and this open airy vibe is great thanks to this huge glass roof. You've also got two directional air vents and two charging points. The MG4 has 353 litres of luggage space and 60-40 split fold seats will cater to larger items. Don't go looking for any additional space up front because there's none. The MG4 does without, despite the fact that the motor is in the back. While the GWM Aura has good space in its cabin, its boot is less accommodating with just 228 litres at play here. It does have 60-40 split fold seats for larger items, but it's also got quite a high lip here for lifting stuff into the boot. And don't look under the bonnet, there's no space there, so you're left leaving your charging cables under the base of the boot. The Cooper Bourne's boot is stubby but usefully deep. It's also got split fold seats for that extra functionality. All up, there's 385 litres at play, but you don't get any additional space under the bonnet in this one. The Polestar's liftback style tailgate is really good for loading larger items like bikes or bulky things, but you'll have to split fold those seats to make the most of this space because you've only got 405 litres to play with. I do like this clever feature though, the luggage separator in the base of the floor. The Ionic 5 story of space continues here with 527 litres behind its split fold seats. It's a generous and usable space, but it's also backed up by another 57 litres under the bonnet. And that's a good spot to store valuables or your charging cables. But it's the Tesla that is the winner on boot space with a whopping 854 litres at play. It also has 40-20-40 split fold seats to accommodate a surfboard or a trip to Bunnings. Now the sheer capacity is measured from the floor to the roof line, so that does help somewhat but it's really easy to see just looking at this that it's going to swallow plenty. 
and if you need more there's another really deep binnacle under the boot floor as well as extra space under the bonnet. All of our contenders are relatively similar in terms of efficiency and because electricity is much cheaper than fuel the difference between the best and worst is only around $70 per year. There is however a massive difference in servicing costs. You'll pay nothing for the first five years with the Polestar while at the other end of the scale, Hyundai charges almost $2,500 over the first six years. EV charging is something of a minefield given the variables surrounding what's doing the charging, the current state of charge, and even the ambient temperature. It's the Tesla that wins in terms of how many kilometers of driving range you can add for each hour of charge. The Tesla also holds up well with faster DC charging. Keep in mind that you'll need some sort of home charger if you're buying a Tesla. And with the Cupra, you'll also need to install a wall box that can utilize the supplied Type 2 and Type 2 cable. It doesn't take long behind the wheel of the MG4 to realize that the engineers have done an excellent job getting the basics right. It's comfy, it's responsive, and acceleration is pretty good too. One thing to watch out for is the range estimator. The MG4 Excite is good for an estimated 350 kilometers per charge, slightly less in the real world. Now you can get an extended range, but that will cost you more, around $6,000 more. The GWM Aura is a very different beast. It may have plenty of equipment, but you soon realize that there's something missing driving pep. Performance in the Aura is good, it's just getting that electric torque to the bitumen can be a bit of a challenge. So unlike the MG4 that is rear wheel drive, the Aura is front wheel drive and it's fairly easy to brake traction, particularly if you're cornering. Now add a bit of wet weather to that and it's all amplified. It just doesn't have that sense of great confidence. And despite a bit of movement through the corners and the body, the suspension picks up a few jitters. So that just also takes the edge off the ride. Now this is the extended range, which is good for up to 420 kilometers. You can get a lesser range for about six grand cheaper. That brings you back to about 310 kilometer range. So great for city-based duties, maybe not so great for longer journeys. Cooper pitches the Bourne as a fun car to drive and it certainly lives up to that, but it's not a hot hatch. The body is nicely controlled, the steering is beautifully communicative and there's just enough of that compliance to make it great for everyday driving. Find the right roads in this car and it is very, very rewarding. Acceleration is peppy, but there's no hiding that 1.9 tonne, which takes the edge off that 170 kilowatt peak power. One of the best things about the Cupra is how far it'll go on a charge. Cupra claims 511 kilometers and given the right circumstances, it feels like a pretty realistic figure. Even in this single motor dynamic trim, the Ionic 5 is still a hearty performer. There's plenty of thrust when you need it and utilizing that power is really easy in this rear drive layout. We've always been a fan of the Ionic 5, to be honest, but its weakness has probably been its suspension. Now in this updated model, it is much better, but it's still not quite as tied down as we'd like. So when you hit a speed hump, it quite noticeably rebounds. As far as the Ionic 5's EV credentials go, it'll go a claimed 507 kilometers on one charge. So that makes this vehicle a very, very practical everyday EV. We can't think of another car in history that's undergone such a significant change at its midlife facelift as the Polestar 2. This single motor model's gone from front drive to rear wheel drive, making it far more athletic. It was a good drive and now it's a great one. Sticky tires and sporty suspension help a lot in that regard. And although it may compromise the ride a tiny bit, we think it's a compromise people will be willing and happy to take. However, the booming 
you get from the suspension can get a little draining. The Polestar also has some serious range on tap from 564 in the standard range to 654 in the long range. That's a lot of Ks. Teslas are an acquired taste and that extends to the way they drive. Early model Ys were pretty firm in their setup, but the new comfort suspension introduced this year has really fixed that somewhat. The super direct steering does take some getting used to, but it's really zippy and it's a great all-rounder. 455 kilometer range isn't spectacular, but then again, you can charge this vehicle at a lot more places than any other EV. It's time to choose a winner. The Car Sales Best Electric Car Award is different to other Car Sales Best Awards because essentially we're asking you to choose between apples and oranges. Somebody considering a GWM Aura wouldn't typically have a Tesla Model Y also on their shortlist, which is where the criteria come in. We have crunched the numbers and it is in fact the GWM Aura to be the first to be knocked out. It's a great electric hatch, but it falls down where driving performance and range are concerned. Similarly, the MG4 struggles in its entry level guys. There is just too much missing, including range between charges. As for the Cupra Born, it's a great little hatch that is a lot of fun, but it loses on outright value, particularly when you consider the potential rivals at hand. The Polestar 2 has gone from a good EV to a great EV with the move from front to rear wheel drive, but it remains hamstrung by its ICE architecture. So down to two, but it's not much of a contest with the Hyundai Ioniq 5 the next to go. It is a great EV option, but it comes with a premium price tag while still missing some key features. Which leaves us with the Tesla Model Y. It is not without fault, but it shines in key areas, including space, tech, value, and where you can charge it. It is a deserving best electric car winner for 2023. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and let us know what you think in the comments.